What's up guys, welcome to The Chess Giant. This is Solomon Rodell, and today we cover a video that many of y'all have been requesting with the Danish Gambit. Now this is one of the most fun and exciting chess openings for white out there, and many don't play it because there is a line in which black can equalize, but even then, there's a couple little tricks and traps white can employ, and even if black doesn't fall for these tricks, white's gonna have a nice game with really no worries. Now the Danish Gambit starts off with e4 and is a response against e5, in which case we're not gonna play knight f3, which is the normal move, but d4 with the center game, putting some pressure on e5. The whole idea here is that if e takes d4 is played, we're not going to take back with the queen, but we're going to offer up yet another pawn with the move c3. And now against d takes c3, we have two different options, both of which we're going to cover in today's video. I want to show you guys not just what your opponent can do so that you're ready for whatever comes your way, but I also want to show you guys different things that you can do. And really, it's just up to you which one you prefer more. For example, in this position, we can play bishop c4, which is what we're going to cover first. And we can also play here the move knight takes c3, which is another very strong option. Let's first cover the move bishop c4, offering up yet a third pawn. And after c takes b2, we're finally going to take that pawn back. And yes, guys, black just took one, two, and then three pawns straight. In this position, we're down two pawns. But really, the main idea here is that we have two very strong bishops. I mean, look at these bishops, guys, just pouncing down on the king side of the board. It's very hard for black to navigate this position, especially if they haven't seen it before. For example, even this bishop on f8, I mean, if it moves to a square like e7 or c5, we're simply going to take the pawn on g7 and win the rook. Now, on top of that, guys, obviously, black did not have to take three straight pawns. So in today's video, we're going to cover different options. What happens if black takes all the pawns? What if black doesn't take any at all? Here in this position, let's cover a few different moves, starting off with a normal looking move like knight c6. I mean, what happens if black just plays normal chess, not really trying to do anything crazy, just developing their pieces? Well, we as white are also going to look to just develop our pieces here with the move knight f3. And if bishop b4 check is ever played, we can simply bring that knight out to c3. And then the very next move, castle kingside. Now, one of the main ideas in the Danish gambit, let's say black plays a move like castling kingside, is throwing our knight to this d5 square. And if you plug this into a computer position, it's going to tell you that black has a very slight advantage after a move like knight e8 or bishop e7, a very small advantage, in which case we're going to continue to play very fun and aggressive attacking chess. But the truth is, is that black is on the very brink of losing this game. I mean, let's say black takes the knight on d5. I mean, this looks like a very logical option. Here we have two minor pieces attacking that knight on f6. Why not just get rid of that very active knight causing black a lot of trouble here? Why not just take it off the board? Well, now in this position, white has the huge edge as we're going to take on d5, forcing this knight to make a decision. Now, let's say black plays a move like knight a5 attacking our bishop. We're not going to defend the bishop with a move like rook c1, but simply bring that bishop back to the square of d3. And yet again, guys, we have a monster bishop pair here, really putting some pressure on that king on g8. And here, if black plays a move like d6, we also have ideas like queen a4. And as y'all can see, I mean, black's pieces are very awkward here. The only way for black to immediately save one of these minor pieces is with the move c5. But now we just play a3, and all of a sudden, the bishop on b4 is trapped. If bishop d7 is played, that's okay. We're going to play queen c2, maintaining the threat of the bishop, and also threatening bishop takes h7 with check. White is simply winning this game. So guys, that covers the move knight a5, attacking our bishop on c4. In this case, we're simply going to bring that bishop back to d3, eyeing that pawn on h7, and both of those minor pieces on the queen side are very awkward. Now, what happens if black plays a move like knight e7, trying to get this knight into the defensive action? Well, let's centralize the queen with queen d4, threatening a mate and one. Whole idea being if f6, we have d6 with check attacking the king and the knight on e7. And if knight f5, attacking the queen and defending g7, we're going to swing our queen over to g4, now attacking this knight on f5. And in the case of either g6 or d6, we're going to play bishop d3. Here we are threatening to capture the knight on f5. We're threatening a mate on g7 once this knight moves. And on top of that, we're also threatening to just pluck this bishop right off the board with queen takes b4. There's so many threats here, and we're simply about to win a piece. Yet again, white is simply winning this. 
So y'all, that covers a move like knight c6. In this case, guys, we're just going to play normal chess, knight f3, knight c3, castle kingside, I that knight d5 move, and we're in business. Now, what happens if black plays in the move bishop b4 check? Now, again, if black plays a move like bishop e7 or bishop c5, this bishop comes out of nowhere and we win the rook. So here, black is trying to get a tempo on our king. And yet again, we're just going to play knight c3. Now, I know many of you are probably wondering in the last variation and in this one why doesn't black just take the knight on c3 i mean they're up in material why not try to trade down here and get rid of our knight d5 ideas well i also don't think that this is a very good idea for black as we can simply take that bishop back and there's currently no defense for that pawn on g7 i mean if a move like knight f6 is played we can now play e5 and here if a move like queen e7 we have queen e2 forcing that knight back home to g8 and in this position if the knight moves i mean besides obviously the square g8 there's a ton of different options that it could technically move to but the knight e4 move is really the only move that doesn't hang the knight so following knight e4 we can simply take that pawn on f7 a key idea and a ton of danish gambit lines the whole idea here being that if king takes f7 we have queen d5 with check attacking the king and the knight on e4 the very next move, we're going to snatch that knight off the board. And following knight c6, we can continue with moves like knight f3. And if queen e7, castle kingside. As y'all can see, this pawn on e5 is making things very difficult for black. And it's very well defended by a bishop, knight, and queen. We're going to continue with moves like rook e1 and rook d1, really ganging up some firepower on the black camp. And notice here, it's very hard for black to navigate this position. I mean, this king can't castle because it's already moved. And if this rook on h8 ever moves, we simply capture that pawn on a7 and if black ever does want to play a move like d6 and then take on e5 yet again we're going to bring our rooks right to the center of the board and then we're going to look to steamroll the opponent if you plug this into a computer program it's going to give you about a 1.5 advantage for white if black plays this game perfectly which is very hard to do that covers following the move knight c3 why black really shouldn't take this knight as tempting as it is now what about the move knight f6 simply developing in this case we're going to play the key move knight e2 this is a key position guys remember this knight e2 idea many of you are probably wondering why knight takes e4 can't just be played black going up three pawns in the position and this is a very good question if black doesn't take the pawn on e4 we can simply continue with moves like castling kingside queen b3 ideas are in the air knight d5 is always an option e5 attacking the knight on f6 we have a ton of different things that we can do here but we're just going to play normal chess if we get that castling kingside move and now if black takes the pawn on e4 we now have yet again that key idea of bishop takes f7 with check followed by queen d5 attacking the king and then the very next move taking that knight off the board now king f8 was by far black's best option and here following a move like queen e7 again black's best move we can play queen f4 with check and if a move like king g8 we can simply castle kingside this is a very interesting position we are down two pawns material per normal with the danish gambit but look at the advantage in development that white has here over the black camp not to mention that this might be the most awkward king i've ever seen in my life white has a huge edge here and is on the brink of simply winning this game so guys, that covers that bishop b4 check idea, in which case we're simply going to play knight c3. And if knight f6 is played, that's okay. We're not going to worry about that pawn on e4 because we can play knight e2. And if knight takes e4 is played, we have that bishop takes f7 check idea followed by queen d5 and we're playing very fun and aggressive attacking chess now the big question is why isn't this opening seen more at the master and grandmaster level and by the way i have seen international master players play this in over the board tournaments so it's not like it's a bad opening but there is a move here that gives black a chance to equalize and that's the move d5 now by the way if black has not previously studied for this opening they are probably not going to find the move d5 in fact d5 is probably the last move i would ever think of as it's currently attacked by our bishop pawn and queen but the whole idea here for black is that after bishop takes d5 black is able to play knight f6 attacking our bishop on d5 now we can't run away with the bishop to a square like c4 or b3 
because then black is simply going to trade queens off the board and there goes all of our attacking chances. But what we can do is play bishop takes f7 with check. King e7 is a huge mistake for black because we're able to play queen b3, really defending that bishop on f7. We're going to have a great position there with a king literally on e7. But here black can take the bishop, and many of you are probably wondering, wait a second, can't we just take the queen on d8? Well, that's what we're going to do. But now black has the key idea of bishop b4 with check while also attacking our queen. Now in this position, guys, we want to get something back for the queen, right? I mean, if we play a move like knight d2 or king f1, we're simply going to lose a queen and have nothing to show for it. So why not play queen d2 and at least get the bishop out of the deal? I mean, following bishop takes d2, we can now take back with the knight. And if you do play this opening against top tier competition, I'm talking master, international, grandmaster level players, this is the position that you're probably going to see a fair amount of the time. Here in this position, we are sitting at yes, even material with a pawn on e4 and i think from a practical sense black will probably play a move like rook e8 looking to defend the square of e5 and also attack the pawn on e4 and now in this position guys following all that craziness yes we are sitting at even material black has given up three pawns we've given up three pawns and we've also given up one minor piece and our queen. Now, if you plug this into a computer program, it's going to give you a very tiny advantage for black. But I personally think that this is a very solid position for white. If you do play this opening against top tier chess competition, I'm talking master, international master, grandmaster level players. This is the position that you're probably going to see much of the time. But I do think that white is completely fine. I mean, if black plays a move here like rook e8, looking to defend the square of e5 and more importantly, attack the pawn on e4. I kind of like this knight f3 idea, especially if you're playing this online against someone. Here it may seem as if black can just take the pawn on e4, but now we have the key idea of knight e5 with check, and all of a sudden, this rook doesn't defend the knight on e4. I mean, if the rook wants to take our knight, thank you for giving us the advantage in material by being up the exchange, and if king g8, we simply take that knight on e4. Huge edge here for white. I mean, these knights are monsters in the center of the board. If a move like knight c6 or knight d7, we're going to continue with f4, and white is simply winning. Now, what happens if black sees that knight e5 check idea and then plays the move knight c6? Well, now we can play the very quick move, castling kingside. And yet again, black may be tempted to take the pawn on e4 because knight e5 ideas are no longer available. However, here, we can simply take that knight off the board and following rook takes e4, knight g5 with check thank you for that rook and last but not least guys if black does not fall into the trap of taking that pawn at all we can simply continue with moves like rookie one rook b1 a very nice file for that rook and here we're just playing chess i would put this position at dead even now guys going back to this original position against the move e5 in which case we play d4 followed by c3 allowing black to take two straight pawns we can play the move bishop c4 allowing black to take a third straight pawn in which case we're going to take back with the bishop have a monster bishop pair on b2 and c4 and we're just playing chess but what if you're not really comfortable with giving up two pawns well there's actually a very good option for you and that's just taking the pawn on c3 with the knight now, this position isn't what most people think of when they think of the Danish Gambit, but if you go on the Gotham Chess YouTube channel, Levy actually recommends the move Knight takes c3 as his favorite option. Here in this position, we're only down one pawn, and no, we no longer have that bishop on b2. I mean, just pouncing down on that pawn on g7. But white still has a very nice edge in development and some very good attacking chances, and this is also a very difficult position to play with as the black pieces. For example, if black plays a move like knight f6, we simply play e5 and all of a sudden the knight has to go straight back home to g8 because our knight on c3 defends d5 and e4 and our queen on d1 defends g4 and h5. And if queen e7 is played, looking to pin the pawn on e5, that's okay. We'll just play queen e2. The pawn is no longer pinned. We're yet again attacking the knight on f6. And if knight g8, we have knight f3 with knight d5 ideas in the air attacking the queen. This is just not a good position for black to play with. So again, guys, following knight takes c3, we're ready to meet knight f6 with e5. And following e5, if queen e7 is played, the key move, queen e2, forcing that knight back home. And we're just playing aggressive and attacking chess. Now, what about the move knight c6, which, by the way, is a much better option, simply defending the square of e5. In this case, we're simply going to continue to develop with knight f3. And yet again, black has a big decision to make. And that's what to do with their dark squared bishop on f8. Does black want to play a move like d6 and hold on to the bishop and have this bishop be a little bit cramped? Or do they want to play the move bishop b4, in which case the 
the bishop is more active, but they're probably going to have to capture that knight on c3 eventually. Let's first cover the move bishop b4, in which case we can now play bishop c4. And against knight f6, we're now going to castle kingside with potential knight d5 and e5 ideas in the air at the master and grandmaster level, the most popular option for black, and it's not even close, is taking off that knight on c3. And against this, we're going to take back with the b pawn. Here, black will usually continue with a move like d6, trying to stop e5. But against d6, we don't really care. We're going to play e5 anyways, whole idea being if d takes e5, we have queen b3. And if the knight captures that pawn, we're going to take that knight off the board and then play the move queen b3. Many of you are probably wondering why on earth did we just give up a pawn? It seems like we did it for no reason. Well, the reason that we played e5 and distracted the pawn on d6 is because now we have this a3 to f8 diagonal. For example here, if black does castle kingside, we can play bishop a3 and this rook on f8 is trapped. And if rook e8 is played, well, all of a sudden we have a very strong battery ram with our bishop and queen. We have bishop takes f7 with check. We win the rook anyways, and white has a nice game. I would definitely give white the edge here. Now, following this whole idea of e5 followed by queen b3, what happens if black sees that whole castling kingside followed by bishop a3 idea trapping the rook and plays the move queen e7 ready to meet bishop a3 with c5? While I still like White's game, as we can now play the move bishop b5 in this position, guys, it is key to keep the pressure on black. If we just play passive moves like h3 or rook b1 or rook d1 even, black's simply going to be able to castle kingside and they're going to be completely okay. We need to keep the pressure on black here and play the move bishop b5. And if the move bishop d7 is played, we can snatch off that bishop. And here black has to give something up. If the knight takes on d7, we simply win the pawn on b7. And if queen takes d7, we say thank you for the pawn on c5. Notice here we are down a pawn in material, but we do have a nice edge in development. And on top of that, this king no longer can castle kingside. And here in a position like this, black will oftentimes try to find some kind of counterplay with knight e4. And many may be tempted to play a move like bishop e3 because of this knight d2 idea attacking both our queen and the rook on f1. But if we play bishop e3, black could simply castle kingside. Now, many of you are probably wondering, following bishop a3, why can't black just play knight d2? And all of a sudden, our queen and our rook are trapped. Well, now we actually have a very nice chess opening trap. I actually recommend that you guys memorize this line. The key move here for white is queen b b4, potentially giving up this rook. Now, if black decides not to take the rook on f1 and instead just plays a move like castling kingside, that's okay. We'll play rook fd1, pinning that knight to the queen on d7, and we have a very nice and fun game there. But if black does take the rook, we're not going to take back the knight, but following giving up our one rook, we're going to offer up a second rook with rook d1. This position has actually been seen twice at the master and grandmaster level, and white won both of them. The whole idea here is that if a move like queen takes d1, taking a second straight rook, we have queen e7 checkmate, game over. And if a move like queen e6, trying to hold on to e7, Black simply can't hold on to everything. I mean, this king right now literally cannot move. It can't move to e7. It can't castle because of our bishop and our queen. And it can't castle to the queen side because of our rook on d1. So following a move like queen e6, I mean, this queen simply can't hold everything together. We're able to play a move like queen b5 with check, forcing queen c6, then taking the pawn, forcing queen e6, and then capturing the pawn on g7, attacking the rook. Yet again, this king cannot move. If a move like rook f8 is played, we simply take the with checkmate and this position is resignable for black so y'all that covers the move bishop b4 in which case we're simply going to continue with bishop c4 castling kingside and if bishop takes c3 is ever played that's okay we're going to take that bishop back with e5 followed by bishop a3 ideas and white has a very nice game now what happens if black decides to hold on to the bishop and plays a move like d6 in this case yet again we're going to play bishop c4 a very common idea with the danish gambit and now, the moment that you see knight f6 play knight g5, using both of our bishop and our knight on g5 in almost fried liver attack type fashion to attack that pawn, 
on f7. Really the only move here that I see here for black is knight e5, attacking our bishop and the pawn on f7. And in this case, let's just slide that bishop back and keep pressure on f7. If black plays h6, trying to get rid of our knight, that's okay. We're not going to run away with our knight, but we're instead going to play f4, attacking the knight on e5. If this knight moves, we're simply going to take that pawn with the knight with a devastating fork on the queen and the rook. And if h takes g5 is played, we're simply going to take that knight back. Now, if you plug this into a computer program, it's going to tell you that bishop g4 is the best move for black, in which case we play queen d4. And in that case, I do think that if black continues to play perfect defense, they're going to have a very small advantage going into the middle game. However, this is almost impossible to find. Here, black playing perfect defensive chess is rarely going to happen. I mean, even if black takes the pawn on e5, all of a sudden, black is simply losing this game because of yet again, bishop takes f7. And now there's actually a big difference from what we covered earlier in this video because following king takes f7, we can actually now just win the queen because bishop b4 is no longer with a check because of that knight on c3. And if king e7, we have queen b3, both the queen and the bishop, very strong here. Nothing can get in the middle of them. And by the way, this king on e7 might be one of the most awkward pieces I've ever seen. Now, guys, following this d6 idea, as I said, I mean, following moves like knight f3 and bishop c4, we're going to wait for black to play knight f6. And the moment black does this, we're going to play knight g5. But what happens if black plays a move like bishop e6? You actually may see this often because here black is trying to trade down material. Our bishop on c4 is very dangerous and very active. Why not try to trade it down? Well, here we're going to take the bishop on e6, and then after f takes e6, play queen b3, attacking both pawns. And if a move like queen c8, looking to hold on to both of the pawns, we play knight g5 with a huge attacking edge. I mean, here, if a move like e5, we have queen f7. If a move like knight d8, defending the pawn on e6, we can simply continue with f4. And notice against knight d8, all of a sudden, every single one of black's major and minor pieces are on the back rank, and we have a huge attacking advantage. We're going to castle king side continue to hurl our pawns and pieces down the board and white has a great game there and if knight d4 trying to play active chess attacking both our queen and defending the pawn on e6 we're simply going to play queen a4 with check and also attacking that knight on d4 so here black really does need to bring that knight back in which case we have yet again another key move i recommend that you guys memorize this line with knight d4 an absolutely killer move whole idea being if king d7 we have knight f4 which is crushing if queen d7 we can simply take the pawn on f6 notice here if the queen takes back we have knight takes c7 with a powerhouse check against the king rook and queen and finally if e takes d5 yes we just gave up a piece but in return we're gonna get that knight on c6 back because it's currently pinned to the king on e8 i mean following a move like knight e7 we can simply take that knight off the board continue with a move like queen e4 throwing a little check in there and if a move like bishop e7 we can simply castle king side knight e6 ideas in the air i mean talk about a very active and dangerous knight right in the center of black's camp and notice here how black can't castle because queen takes h7 simply wins the game now, guys, really what we just did is cover the accepted lines and variations. Going back to the second move in the Danish Gambit with d4, we are prepared to meet. E takes d4 with c3, in which case if d takes c3, we can play either bishop c4 or knight takes c3. Both are great options. It's really up to you depending on which one you like the most. But what happens if black doesn't take the pawn on c3, but instead goes into one of the declined variations here? First off, if d3, I don't really think that we need to be too worried about this move. We're simply going to take back with the bishop with tempo, even out the game material-wise, continue to develop our pieces, and we're just playing chess. However, we should spend a little bit of time on the move d5 here black simply expanding in the center of the board and against this i personally kind of like taking that pawn and then against queen takes d5 playing c takes d4 now this is a very imbalanced position there is pluses and minuses from both sides for example i do think that this pawn on d4 could potentially be a very vulnerable weakness for black to attack if we're not ready for it and this queen on d5 is very active but at the same time we can play moves like knight c3 and kick this queen around here let's say black does try to take advantage of this isolated pawn and plays the move knight c6 now we can simply play the move knight f3 defending it and if bishop g4 
we have bishop e2. Now this may seem like a crushing position for black, but here black actually can't win the pawn on d4 by taking the knight on f3 and then playing queen takes d4. The reason for this is that we now have bishop takes c6, removing the defender, which just defended the queen. And the very next move, we're simply up a queen at move 10 in this game. So again, guys, the bishop takes f3. We simply take back, attack the queen, and if queen takes d4, thank you for the knight, thank you for the queen, we honestly have a game over. What about if black plays the move bishop b4 with check? This is what you're going to see most of the time in this variation. Black playing bishop g4, bishop b4, queen takes d5, trying to play very active and very aggressive. Don't be too worried here. We're simply going to play knight c3. And here, if a move like castling queenside, we can play castling kingside. Now notice, black can no longer play bishop takes f3 because we simply win the queen. And if a move like queen a5, black is putting some pressure on f3 and our pawn on d4, but now we can simply continue with the move bishop e3. Now if black plays a move like knight f6, we have ideas like rook c1, a3, h3, queen b3 even. We're just going to continue to play chess, and I honestly think that white is completely fine there. The big question here is why can't black just take the knight on c3 and then play queen takes c3. Now black is up a pawn and it seems like they have a very active game. However, here white is on the brink of simply winning this as we have rook c1 and no matter where this queen goes, guys, I don't care if this queen goes to b2, a3, even the square a5, no matter where this queen goes, we're gonna take the knight on c6 and then play knight e5. And guys, this is a monster knight right in the center of the board, threatening to capture the bishop on g4, threatening to capture the pawn on c6, which by the way, would fork the queen and the rook. And we also have this knight takes f7 idea, forking both the rook on d8 and the rook on h8. There's simply no way for black to get around all of this. The best move here for black is bishop takes e2, but in this case, we're simply gonna take back with the queen, and yet again, we're threatening to take the pawn on c6 and take the pawn on f7, and on top of that, this king on c8 is extremely vulnerable. For example, if black plays the move queen d5, trying to somehow hold this position together, we now just play queen a6. Notice how this king can no longer run away because of our knight on e5, and if king b8, we now have rook b1 with check, followed by knight takes c6, and here of king a8, we have ourselves a game over. So guys, that covers what happens if a move like queen a5. We're simply going to play bishop e3, supporting our pawn on d4, and then after that, we're going to play moves like rook c1, a3, h3, we're just playing chess, and following queen a5 and bishop e3, if black does take the knight on c3, we're going to take back with the pawn, and after queen takes d3, we have rook c1, followed by rook takes c6, knight e5, and white is crushing that game. But what happens in this position if black doesn't want to run around with the queen and play a move like queen a5, but simply take that knight off the board? This may be tempting, but I actually think that it gives up black's biggest edge in this position, and that's that this pawn on d4 is no longer isolated. Black did have one advantage, and that's that this pawn on d4 is isolated, but it's isolated no more. In fact, this is a very strong pawn, and here white simply is much better. We can play moves like rook b1, a very nice long file for that rook, moves like h3. We always have c4 ideas attacking that queen on d5. We can always throw our queen on a square like a4 or d3. Bishop e3 is in the works preparing that c4 idea. I mean, we're just going to continue to naturally develop our pieces. We have an edge in development, and white is simply better here, and black really has nothing to show for it. So y'all, that covers what happens if black takes the first pawn, but then doesn't take the second. Now what happens if we play d4 with technically the center game at this point and black decides not to take this pawn at all? We play d4, they're like, look, I'm not even gonna mess with taking that pawn. I'm gonna play a move like d6 or knight c6. Let's first cover the move d6. What happens if black just defends the pawn on e5? Well, I don't think that this is a very good option for black as we can now just take that pawn on e5 and then capture queens right off the board. And now, yes, we just traded off queens at move four, but white does have a big edge in the sense that our king can castle and their king cannot. In fact, here we can play bishop c4, attacking that pawn on f7. And here, if we move like f6, we can continue with bishop e3, continue to just naturally develop our pieces, even play castling queenside, bringing our rook to d1 with a check against the king on d8. And here, white is simply up a ton of development. 
And honestly, this is just a very comfortable and easy position to play with as white. It's not like a crushing variation, in which case, you know, we're going to win the game in 15 to 20 moves, but it's just a very easy option that's going to give you a clear edge. So again, guys, following d4, if a move like d6, we're simply going to capture that pawn on e5, take the queen on d8, and white's going to have a very nice edge. Now, what happens if black plays the move knight c6, simply defending the pawn on e5? We can play the move d5, which, by the way, is a good option, expanding right in the center of the board, attacking that minor piece. Piece, but I personally kind of like taking the pawn on e5 and then following knight takes e5, playing the immediate f4, kicking this knight back, continuing with moves like bishop c4, knight f3, continuing here with a move like knight c3. Yes, we do have an edge in development. I mean, we're going to continue with moves like castle and kingside, but I think our biggest advantage here is that these pawns on e4 and f4 are literally taking half of the fifth rank, and it's going to be very hard here for black to find any kind of counterplay, and I like white's game. If you'd like to learn the theory behind the ready gambit, one of my favorite openings for white against the French defense, click the video to the left. If you'd like to see our top 10 chess openings for black against the move d4, click the video to the right. Leave a comment below to let me know what other videos you'd like to see covered on this channel. And as always, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. Peace.